Hello there, and welcome to the second episode of the Psycare UK podcast, Frontiers in Harm Reduction. I'm Rodri Kareem, trainee, psychotherapist, and longtime field volunteer with the charity. For those of you new to our work, Psycare UK offers transformative welfare and psychedelic harm reduction. We offer advice and interventions to reduce the risk of drug taking. But the core of our work is supporting people through crisis, whether drug-induced or otherwise, at festivals and events across the UK, and occasionally in Europe too. Our service is based on the premise that with the right support in the right circumstances, a bad trip can be transformed into a meaningful breakthrough experience. As part of this series, we'll be meeting the intrepid souls and dedicated practitioners working at the face of the psychedelic renaissance. These are folks exploring the meaning, structure and possibilities of these extraordinary states of mind, including the dangerous, harmful or just plain confusing territory that can be opened up when we take the business of meaning making into our own hands. The narrative around psychedelics currently emphasizes the transformative potential of these so-called wonder drugs and misses out the real pitfalls that can come with exploring these expansive states of mind. We'll be exploring the wider context of psychedelic plants, culture, philosophy and experience and having a go at the eternal question which psychedelics have once again confronted us with. Who gets to decide what we experience and how we make sense of it? This episode, we're delighted to welcome my Psycare colleague Anya Ermakova to the podcast. Anya's wide-ranging experience charts a course between some vital aspects of psychedelic science and the social and ecological practice of harm reduction. She's worked at the coalface of the psychedelic renaissance since 2015, having served as a science officer for the Beckley Foundation, as well as long-standing involvement as a psycare field volunteer and as a board member of the Shakruna Institute, a non-profit advocating for the greater involvement of indigenous and ecological perspectives in the psychedelic research world. Her research interests stretch from the design of clinical trials to the neurobiology of psychosis to conservation of the Sonoran Desert toad, possibly the only psychedelic amphibian known to science. Our chat took us into some fascinating territory, with the jumping off point being Anya's recent work on clinical trials of 5-MeO-DMT, a unique short-acting psychedelic that produces emotional but diffuse experiences quite unlike the content-rich cornucopia of the classical psychedelics. We ranged across the psychopolitics of intense, short-acting psychedelic experiences, to the wonder of psychedelic communities, such as that surrounding the work of psyche, and through to the ecological consequences of the increasing popularity of 5-MeO-DMT on Sonoran Desert Toads, which are being exploited to serve a booming market in retreats. There's lots of juicy detail on toad-milking bootleggers, the need for pluralism in the psychedelic research community, and Anya's own passions and interests that drive her work and reverence for the psychedelic experience. So, without further ado, let's hear our conversation. Welcome, Anya. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you, Rodri, for inviting me. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Yeah, no problem at all. And we've been blabbing loads even before hitting record. And I thought that we may as well hit record so that we don't uh, miss any lovely tidbits of information. Um, but yeah, kind of w one of the things we were talking about just now is where it all begins for you. Uh, I can uh, pinpoint uh, very precisely where, where it all began for me. And I remember when I was 16 years old, I, um, I was very much interested in psychoanalysis and reading books by Freud and Jung and very much interested in this sort of things. And completely by accident, I read a book by Carlos uh, Castaneda. And at the time, I had no idea that the guy was not a real anthropologist, that he made it all up and is generally a very shady character. But I was very impressed by his first three books. And as I was uh, reading uh, about it and reading about Piot and about mushrooms and I think the tour as well, something clicked in my brain and I thought, ah, I have to try those substances. This is exactly would be the royal road to unconscious that would lead us to understanding what's what's going on there. But because I grew up in Russia and I grew up in a small provincial city and I had absolutely no knowledge on how to obtain any psychedelics or psychoactive substances, all people I knew were either drunk alcohol or smoked cigarettes and drug use was only drug abuse 
that you walk around and see homeless people injecting uh, something. And um, yeah, so I, I was trying to figure out how am I going to try psychedelics, trying various legal things like nutmeg and uh, uh, things like that. And in the process, reading everything I could find about psychedelics. I can certainly remember age 13, 14, growing up in the Middle East, obviously also no access to any such thing. Um, finding Erowid, a database of trip reports. And if any of the listeners have not heard of or explored Erowid, I really encourage you to do so because it's an extraordinary treasure trove of information and free to access decades of work. And uh, one of these original kind of, yeah, touchstones of the psychedelic world and community. I guess this is an experience that that many seekers share. Yeah, being in a space that feels sort of restricted or where there's not much opportunity to explore or somehow out of step with what's around you. Yeah, and um, no no community, not even like... I had uh, one or two friends that were also very much interested in that, but we had no connection to anyone mm. who could who could help us. Yeah. And no one to talk to and talk about what we would read. Erovid, yeah, is a great, great resource that we read <laughs> a lot of. And so what brought you into working with Psyche then? How was it that you ended up in a support role in these experiences? Well, fast forward a few years from the age of 16 and just learning about psychedelics. Yeah. I went uh, to study um, in Scotland. So I did my undergrad studying biology in uh, the University of Edinburgh and I specialized in neuroscience and then after that I went to do PhD in psychiatry and as I was doing PhD in psychiatry I was uh, doing uh, some clinical work which was mainly uh, interviewing and uh, doing clinical assessments um, and uh, recruiting participants with uh, psychosis for my research there. My research was very uh, quantitative, fMRI-based, very much uh, biomedical model of psychiatry. And I always felt that something is missing for me in this very computational uh, quantitative research. So I wanted to do something that's directly useful. And uh, with my interest in psychedelics, I learned about Psycare. I think my first festival with Psycare was Secret Garden Party back in 2013 or 14. And I've tried it once and I've realized that this is so much needed service at festivals and outside of the festivals too, but so far it's uh, mainly at festivals. And uh, yeah, that's I've been doing it ever since on a couple of festivals a year. And it's such a different experience to the clinical trial environments in which you're working at the moment and which you've experienced stuff in the past. So what kind of environment is that like for people? Just to answer your question, what is it like to take psychedelics in a clinical trial for a healthy volunteer? And uh, so far we've uh, finished the uh, phase one trials with healthy volunteers with the uh, 5-MeO DMT. Healthy volunteers who are also psychedelically naive, which is quite unusual in the space. Mm. Usually people are uh, psychedelically experienced. And the reason why we recruited psychedelically naive uh, people is uh, because that's been requested by the regulatory authorities. And mm. they said that we have to recruit healthy volunteers that would be as similar to your average clinical population. and they assume that they're going to be mostly psychedelically naive. Mm. So we went with psychedelically naive people, which I think was actually an excellent advice because there is uh, so much learning that we can get from people who have never tried psychedelics. Uh, learning in terms of what, how better to explain what psychedelic experience is like and how to prepare people who have never taken psychedelics before to it. Something that we would not have learned from people who already are prepared for psychedelic experience mm -hmm. by their previous uh, uh, life. Mm -hmm. And what an experience, 5-MeO-DMT as well. How has that been for people who are psychedelically naive generally to encounter such a powerful substance? Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot talk in detail about the results of the trial because it's uh, just uh, finished. So we are still doing the mm -hmm. analysis. 
but in brief I can talk uh, about that it can be a very very intense experience and uh, a lot of things can come up for, for the participants uh, in the within the clinical trials we have full-on support there is always a trained uh, a psychedelic monitor, usually clinically trained with a psychotherapy qualification who is there to support. And there also it's done in the context of uh, several preparation sessions and also several integration sessions afterwards. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's done in the medical settings. So it's as safe as possible from a physiological point of view. And uh, we also try our best to make the space look less clinical, mm. even though you know, there are always nurses and there are a lot of procedures going on as well during the experience. For example, people have their blood taken for pharmacokinetics to see how the drug is breaking down in the body. Right. Okay. Uh, people have their heart rate measured, blood pressure, temperature throughout the experience. They are asked uh, regularly about the intensity of the experience. So this can be a bit distracting because there's a lot of medical procedures going on around mm. but what uh, we do still we try to make space look less clinical by decorating it with uh, beautiful nature scenes bringing flowers to the to the space some soft lighting not the white fluorescent lights you get in uh, hospitals mm -hmm. uh, playing some music uh, there is a playlist uh, for the study specifically chosen. Yeah, there is uh, there are certain breathing techniques and relaxation techniques that help people to relax into the experience. So yeah, we, we try our best to make the experience as not clinical as possible. Mm. I guess I'm interested to hear about, because you said you'd also been a participant in such a trial mm -hmm. using DMT. So from your perspective, how different was it taking DMT in a clinical setting or what were the yeah what did you notice uh, so I, I was a participant in uh, actually two DMT trials at Imperial College London mm. led by Chris uh, Timmerman mm -hmm. and the first one was uh, an uh, fMRI study mm. uh, where it was also intravenous injection but it was a bolus injection so you get the high dose of DMT or placebo on a different occasion mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you're inside an MRI scanner and then the second trial that I participated at Imperial that uh, follows up from the first one was the continuous infusion study where you also get intravenous injection of DMT but it's uh, administered continuously for half an hour rather than just one dose. So correspondingly, the experience lasts about 45 minutes, mm. which is the infusion keeps you at a peak for about half an hour and then it tails off like a normal DMT experience would. And that was escalating doses. So you start with a low dose and it gradually increases and increases and increases until you end up with quite a high dose. So yeah, those were the two trials that I've participated at Imperial. And uh, it's been quite an experience, I have to say, because uh, DMT is incredibly intense. And having a DMT experience for half an hour mm. is is uh, really, really interesting. It's really fascinating. And I think for me it was fascinating because before, with the, the usual either smoke DMT or that first infusion that was inside an MRI scanner, uh, it was... Uh, you always start going into this DMT mindscape with really fast moving patterns and colors and as you start making sense of that, that space that feels very otherworldly you get out of the experience back to normal reality while in the continuous infusion by spending more time in that space, your brain kind of starts building up a story out of this fast moving abstract patterns. And mm. the stories that your brain reconstructs from it are incredibly um, coherent and very, very, very um, easy to believe in. And uh, actually for me as a scientist was very interesting because I have never experienced true hallucinations in the sense that 
when you are in the moment, you really believe that this is happening. Mm. And it's very, very, like, it's almost like a story to it. And I had three quite intense DMT experiences with different those levels. And all three of them were in the moment. I was like, wow, this is real. Like, I've seen entities and had quite uh, odd experiences of um, otherworldly nature. And then as you come out of the experience, you realize, oh, wow, but this this felt so real. But then you start to question the, the validity of your experience and then reference it with your beliefs about the nature of reality and then you realize yeah well that's probably a construct of my mind but it feels very real in the moment and uh, yeah that's made me realize how uh, after dmt so many people start like reconsider their beliefs about the nature of reality Mm, yeah and that's interesting to have that experience from the inside and obviously as a as a thoroughly rigorous uh student of reality Mm -hmm. you're doing the comparisons between various evidence in various states of mind to try and arrive at some sort of position about what you're sure about what you're not sure about Mm -hmm. which sounds an awful lot like what we might talk about as integration Mm -hmm. this comparison or this traveling from a very different state of mind into one's everyday state of mind and seeing how the two can influence each other i'd love to hear about your opinions about these different substances because as a phenomenology researcher, obviously you're interested in the qu- the quality of the experience and what people notice and what changes mm-hmm. before and after. So I guess, like you say, you're not going to share the kind of conclusions with me of this current research. But something that I've often wondered is that DMT experiences seem to be incredibly intense and much harder to integrate than other kinds of psychedelic. DMT or 5-MeO DMT or both? Well, specifically DMT. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know much about 5-MeO-DMT. I'm fascinated to find out because something that we uh, were chatting about before we started recording and something that you mentioned that really interested me was that you said that 5-MeO-DMT experiences seem to have a more uh, grounded or relatable quality to them than just straightforward DMT experiences. Before um, coming up with the, my research project about phenomenology of 5-MeO-DMT experiences, I spent a lot of time on Erwid, as Rodri mentioned before, <laughs> and 5-Hive, um, and Reddit, and uh, all the other places on the internet where you can find about people's subjective experiences, and also read everything I could find about 5-MeO experiences from books like Tikal and uh, book by James Orock, The Tryptamine Palace, which is a fascinating book. And of course, the best resources, uh, Ralph Metzner's The Toad and the Jaguar, uh, based on his, I don't know how many hundreds of underground ceremonies that he's done with 5 DMT specifically over the course of 20 years or so until it got banned in the United States in 2011. Um, so yeah, I have, I, I had quite a um, good idea of what 5-MeO-DMT could be like, certainly in the recreational or ceremonial settings before going on to clinical trials. And very often it's contrasted with DMT experience. So I can definitely talk about that, what's what's out there in the literature and um, draw comparisons between those. And um, what I want to say is that there are three very intense and very short uh, acting psychedelics. One is DMT, one is 5-MeO-DMT, and one is salvian. The All three of them have very qualitatively distinct um, subjective experiences, even though some may argue that they're equally intense. Uh, that That's a matter of, of opinion, but I, I think they are, they could be equally intense with the right dose. Um, but I'll, I'll talk mostly about comparing DMT and 5-MeO-DMT. Because, yeah, there is less information out there about salvia and because it's not a classic psychedelic, it's uh, not likely to be researched as much. So uh, if you compare DMT and 5-MeO-DMT, DMT is very contentful. So a lot of things happen in the DMT experience, like, for example, uh, so many people, uh, Terence McKinnon notably, and many people after him talk about entity encounters, this classic machine elf experience where people encounter entities, whether they're aliens or 
gods or some other creatures, spirits, and uh, communicate with them somehow or very often travel to other worlds or other dimensions of this world. And uh, there is very, very um, strong things that happen in the experience that people can come back with. Uh, while with 5MU DMT, it's notably content-free. Hmm. So it's very much embodied experience, very much emotional experience, and not so much visual experience. Um, in fact, uh, if you read the reports on Arvid about 5MU, most people say it's not visual at all. Hmm. But it's very much like so many people describe that it's like if, if there is anything visual, it's the white light. It's complete ego dissolution and non-dual experience. It's very much described as uh, the psychedelic that is much easier to have non-dual experience than with mm. other ones. So that's that's the key difference. Like one is that you you are transport with DMT or transported somewhere and you interact with something otherworldly while in the other is more that you feel very strong first embodied experience then maybe lose track of the body and external environment altogether and dissolve in the white light and have this transcendental non-dual experience. Hmm. Is it just pharmacology then that's doing that? Or is there something uh, different about the contexts that might be aiding that? Uh, so the, the context that I'm describing, those experiences are both reported from the recreational or ceremonial settings. Yep. And uh, uh, generally there is uh, research with 5-MeO DMT. Um, I think the paper is by Ciped et al. 2020, which shows that uh, the... The transcendental non-dual experiences are more common in the ceremonial settings mm -hmm. rather than recreational ones, but they can occur in either. And yeah, of course, it's uh, like all psychedelics, it's very much set and setting dependent. And particularly with 5-MeO-DMT, there have been very concerning uh, facilitators. Mm. There were uh, some facilitators that you can find videos on YouTube that use that taser people at the peak of their 5-MeO experience or pour water into their throats or do all sorts of other unethical practices. And there are some fatalities that happened in, in mm. with those type of facilitators. But yeah, generally speaking, in the ceremonial settings are more conductive to more mystical type experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting one there. Because, of course, there's a proliferation, pro pro I can never say that word, mm -hmm. proliferation of retreats and facilitators and ghetto shamans who decide that they can take it upon themselves to hold space for very intense and overwhelming experiences. So you talked about these short-acting, intense psychedelics. We haven't talked about, for instance, psilocybin or LSD or mescaline all of which take a lot longer. Although they can produce intense experiences, maybe that isn't the characteristic way in which people have used them before. So what is the draw of these super intense, very short acting psychedelics? Uh, the draw in the recreational use or in the clinical well, trials? Well, I guess, I guess both really, because yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, okay, now this is my opinion. Uh, it seems like DMT and other really short-acting psychedelics seem to produce experiences that are much harder for people to integrate. Uh, they're much more of a challenge because it's so out of the ordinary and so brief and so intense. Because in terms of the pharmaceutical industry, in terms of looking at psychedelics as a treatment, as things are moving towards, a short-acting, intense psychedelic maybe makes sense in terms of what to offer people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Like, why would people seek intense, uh, hard to comprehend experiences mm -hmm. at all, whether recreationally, ceremonially or medically? Mm -hmm. So medically, the answer is the easiest, I guess. Uh, the reason why medically a short acting experience is uh, generally preferred is because of the resource use. So imagine if sometime in the future, this is going psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, 
uh, is going to be part of uh, pharmacopoeia and it's going to be used in clinic. The amount of resources needed to hold space for somebody who is tripping for six to eight hours is completely different to somebody who is tripping for an hour or half an hour in terms of therapists, in terms of the actual physical space where the experience takes place, in terms of yeah, many, many other things. So yeah, it makes sense that before we, and also we don't know what aspects of the experience are. Is it the duration that matters? Is it the intensity that matters? Is it the content of the experience that matters? What we have the information so far, there is a lot of correlations of potential therapeutic outcomes in terms of depression, anxiety, or substance use disorders with the mystical experience. So if we can have a substance that induces mystical experience that catalyzes this quantum change for people in Mm -hmm. a short period of time, uh, while saving the resources in terms of therapists' uh, time, that could potentially give access for more people for this treatment. Mm -hmm. And when you say mystical experience, you mean introverted, unitive, one with everything, egoless, yeah, of a specific kind of mystical experience. Specific right? yeah. kind of mystical experience. Well, specifically the one that's measured by mystical experience questionnaire developed by Johns Hopkins, yes. because that's that's the uh, research that started it all. And they were the first to show correlations between the scores on this particular questionnaire, asking the questions about different aspects of mystical experiences that you just outlined mm. and therapeutic efficacy. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's my answer of why short uh, acting psychedelics are mm. preferred in the clinical settings. Mm-hmm. Then uh, the question why they preferred in the recreational settings, I guess that's, uh, that would be curiosity. Mm. Like it is fascinating to travel in those realms that DMT can (laughs) take you to, it is very otherworldly. And I fully agree that it's difficult to relate those experiences to your personal life. Uh, I mean, some people do, and some people say that they've learned important information in those otherworldly encounters. But generally speaking, you're, I don't know, less likely to relieve your personal memories and get insights into your personal life after a DMT experience. Although I've heard people who found DMT experiences very therapeutic, so I can't generalize. Yeah, and also just from a personal observation, uh, DMT is a lot more common in recreational use than 5-MeO DMT. That might be a matter of availability and access to it, particularly in Europe. Might be a matter of people knowing about 5-MeO DMT, and it's it's a lot less known than than DMT. There haven't been that many famous people like Terence McKenna talking about. Well, actually, Terence McKenna talked about both and tried both, and he I don't think he was particularly liked 5-MeO DMT experience <laughs> compared to DMT. But yeah, in recreational use at festivals, even what we see with psycare and uh, just by walking around at festivals, you can occasionally get the smell of DMT vapes, which are now becoming very popular, Mm -hmm. which I have never heard or seen anyone use 5-MeO DMT, say, at the festival settings. Interesting. So there's something about it that maybe doesn't lend itself so much to recreational settings? Yeah, I I think so. I think it's a lot more, it's hard to describe why it doesn't lend itself to recreational settings as much. Maybe it feels a lot more personal in a sense, like it's Mm. a lot more emotional and it's maybe something that people are not quite ready to go through through at the festival setting rather than a quick trip in and out. But yeah, I actually don't know why why it's less popular in the recreational settings. Mm. Maybe people take it more seriously than yeah. DMT. That's another thing is, again, when they read the certain trip reports about those intense non-dual experiences. And also, uh, these experiences can often be very scary and uh, terrifying. Like a lot of people talk about ego death or experience of dying and rebirth from it, like from... Uh, Arabic descriptions, these experiences are not always uh, amazing. They can be terrifying or they can be terrifying one minute and then quite scary uh, and then, but then quite uh, beautiful afterwards. 
So there is a lot of change, a lot of things can happen in this short period of time, but yeah, there's certainly not something that's taken lightly, maybe. Mm -hmm. Wondering about then how sake fits into all of this. Do you feel like your work with sake has kind of informed the direction of research at all and the kind of things that you bring to research? And what's your experience been like, I guess, working with people on these very short acting, intense psychedelics when you've come across them in psych care settings? Well, the, the thing is in psych care settings, I don't think I have come across anyone on short acting psychedelics mm. uh, because they're short acting by the time that people get to us, maybe uh, they are not tripping anymore. So sometimes it comes up uh, when people just come to the fire and want to have a chat and they bring it up and uh, it's more like sort of the integration type work yeah. almost but not like, while they're acutely under the effects mm -hmm. so in psyche we often encounter more long uh, acting psychedelics how i see psyche fitting in my life in general i see it very much as something complementary to what i do for work, because for work, I mainly sit in front of computer and uh, read and write things. And it's very much a desk based job, except for the times where I do the interviews, but it's a small part of all the things that I do. Mostly I read, write, teach. I don't do so much direct work with people and certainly not something that approaches clinical work. Mm. For me, it is something very satisfying working directly with people and helping them. And uh, it's almost like a more direct experience. Like when you work in research, you do something and then maybe a year later or a year and a half, you see paper come out of it. It's this separation between what you do and the results of your work. While in working with people, there is this immediate feedback of uh, doing something and getting the response. And it's incredibly rewarding to uh, see this transition of somebody who has a difficult experience and then a few hours later they come out of it and uh, uh, that changes their life a little bit mm. and you feel like you've done something good it seems to me like there will always be a space for organizations like psyche and that actually not just in terms of attending to the people who continue to use it recreationally but if more people are approaching it as a tool for personal exploration, as a treatment for mental health issues, and generally just out of curiosity, then harm reduction is going to need to, and integration more generally, and the idea of what do we do with these experiences is going to become potentially a bit more widespread and mainstream. So the kind of people who participate in the trials, but then also when it starts to become something that is openly available, where do they go when they leave the trial site? And what happens to them once they're no longer part of the caseload? Yeah, that's, that's a very, very important question. And this is uh, something that we are trying to figure out is how can we extend the support network for people who've gone through the trials after the trial finished and mm. how we can almost have the community out there to support people who would need more integration or people who want to work with psychedelics in different contexts. And uh, my personal opinion is that uh, medicalization is uh, never going to be the only way psychedelics are going to be used. Even uh, within the current uh, prohibition uh, settings, there are still so many ways people use psychedelics. Also, the regulatory landscape is changing very rapidly, not in the UK so far, but if you look at US with the Colorado last, just last week voting to uh, effectively decriminalize and legalize certain aspects of uh, psychedelics. And uh, the same thing happened in Oregon and in various cities, and it's just going to grow. Definitely now in this dynamic landscape where everything changes, we need more organizations that support people, particularly people who have just been introduced to psychedelics, who maybe, I don't know, watched Michael Pollan documentary on Netflix or something, decided to try it with some unscrupulous facilitator and have been traumatized by that. Like, how do we have enough support uh, for these people? Like, of course, there are people who go to you know, festivals, there are a bit more, I, I would think, 
experienced or maybe know other people. But even then, still, like, Psycare does amazing work. And at festivals, we see so many people that without Psycare would have had a very difficult time. But yeah, what, what we do outside of festivals is how we must, like, expand Psycare to the yeah. wider society outside of the festival settings. It's something very important to think about. And there are some organizations that uh, do it, like Fireside, that do support for people who are having difficult experiences, not at festivals, but anywhere. They have a phone line. And there are various integration groups that uh, exist and uh, keep appearing. Including the Psycho one. Including can... <laughs> the Psycho one, yeah. Which you can plug on here. I guess this is this is a real area of interest for me and maybe outside the scope of your, your research, but I'm still super interested to hear your own personal perspectives on it. It's like, what does that look like then? What does it look like when Psycare is no longer confined to festivals and Fireside is no longer just the phone line? Uh, for me, we start to veer into like the realms of institutions, whether it's stuff like healthcare. In Argentina, for instance, they have free provision of psychotherapy to everyone. We used to have religions. We still do have religion, some, and uh, some people participate in it. And those are, I guess, groups of people and resources and places that do that kind of outreach to people in distress. Do any of these models make sense for what a psychedelic kind of extending psyche or extending harm reduction into? Mm -hmm. I think all of these models make sense. And I think that psychedelics are something that's very hard to pin into one particular uh, framework and uh, that's why I sincerely hope that medicalization of psychedelics is not going to be the only route. Mm. Uh, there, there should be space for of course medical use of psychedelics with different types of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy not just what is now understood as psychedelic assisted psychotherapy which is this humanistic based approach of just support and listening which is very non-directional mm -hmm. like i wish there was a wide variety of different psychotherapy options afterwards mm -hmm. after the experience that match a particular type of person who, who has taken psychedelics and there are always people who are going to use psychedelics recreationally for fun because it is fun and it is interesting and there are the arguments about cognitive liberty are something I very much relate to. Mm. These people should not be punished for that. I don't think so. And we all know all this uh, stories of the war of drugs and the consequences of it. There are always going to be people who would prefer to use psychedelics in religious settings even outside of particular religions like Santo Daime or um, like those ayahuasca religions mm. or Native American Church Native as well. American Church mm. as well. Like there are always going to be people using it in this stru structured context of a uh, organized religion and there are always going to be people who use it in a less structured but still religious context, maybe something neo-shamanic, uh, more eclectic, a mixture of different approaches and uh, I believe that yeah, psychedelics should not be shoehorned into one one corner and all these approaches should exist in parallel and what I guess we can do is uh, work on whatever approach uh, we feel most comfortable and make it better. And I guess in order to do that there needs to be the possibility of people who are not uh, for instance, with I'm thinking about particularly um, the Compass uh, synthetic psilocybin trials that are going on. And the question is, how on earth is a for-profit research company going to make back the huge amount of money that gets poured into a clinical trial with a very short-acting or inexpensive treatment? And the question is whether or not there will be an attempt to restrict use of that particular treatment to people trained in a particular method that might be patented or copyrighted by like a particular organization. So, you know, only compass trained uh, therapists operating in a compass trained way in compass certified centers. I guess there's a, there's a tension at play between the medical model and medical psychedelics and the rest of it, because in order for the rest of it to flourish, it requires 
the medical system to have an understanding of and a, an awareness of and a, and a respect for those things. Otherwise, the basic profit motives just apply. Does it feel like in the medical world there's an awareness of all these other approaches? In the medical world and in the world of clinical trials, there is awareness of these other approaches and uh, there is there are conversations about them and there is also some fear about those alternative approaches. There is also understanding that they are going to, to be there. Like, for example, in the United <laughs> States with uh, all those changes in yeah. drug laws. This is this is happening regardless of medicalization. Yeah, exactly. So th- this is there, and um, which surely changes the landscape a little bit for the medicalization. Yeah, thing. and uh, yeah. also I don't think it's so much going to be a monopoly. Of course, Compass is very much ahead of everybody else because they started phase three trials and just published the results of their phase two trial, and. Uh, they, they've started earlier and they have uh, a lot of resources. Uh, but there are also lots and lots of other companies and they're all out there in this uh, race to bring their products to market. So, so far, I don't see that there is a monopoly because there are so many substances, so many formulations of these substances, mm-hmm. so many ways different companies approach it, like some use it as therapy. Some are trying to develop non-psychedelic psychedelics, mm-hmm. which is the whole new topic of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> That's very interesting. Uh, and as a phenomenologist, maybe not so interesting. but Yeah, for me, it's not so interesting, <laughs> but yeah. it's interesting to think, like, would they work? Would they not? Like, imagine if they do work and we don't know, maybe they would work. <laughs> inco- it's just really quite incomprehensible for me. But yeah, it's such yeah. a fascinating area of, of uh, study. Or they yeah. would work in the same way that say ketamine works they provide relief for like two or three weeks and then uh, people relapse while if you use it as a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy they would work for a few months if not years Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah these are all very interesting questions and i think they're worth doing trials as an investigating and uh, demonstrating whether non-psychedelic psychedelics would work or not. But yeah, where I was going before I went on a tangent about that is that currently we are not in the world that even within the context of medicalization, we have monopolies. There are many companies and many, many psychedelics and different approaches to, to treatments that are out there. Mm. I guess what I haven't said is uh, another reason why I really like psych in addition to direct uh, interaction with people and like seeing the results of your work is I really like the community of people in psych care. Mm. And this has been a huge, huge uh, positive uh, influence on my life is just meeting so many wonderful people through psych care and uh, still keeping in touch outside of psych care or recognizing familiar faces at various events and... Mm. Uh, throughout the year outside of festivals and yeah this makes huge huge positive impact on life and there's something about psychedelics that seems to tap into that Mm -hmm. for sure the it allows for the formation of new communities temporary communities Mm -hmm. or persistent ones and ones that span uh all kinds of social categories as well puts us in a very kind of as you know unitive space where the differences between us maybe aren't quite so mm-hmm. visible. Obviously, when we now come down and back into reality, those differences reemerge, and the challenge that that experience presents us with is how to how to honour difference, but also honouring that sameness, that oneness. Mm-hmm. That's an aspect of psychedelics that I think is one of the most. I don't know. I don't want to say understudied because I saw that there was a, a paper on it and I think that it was uh, I think that um, Robin Carr Harris was one of the authors on this paper which was about communitas mm-hmm. and the the experience of being with others as a key determining factor of the kind of lasting change mm-hmm. that they were seeing in psychedelics and I can't quite remember the paper or when it was published but I also remember that there aren't a huge amount of studies on the group Mm-hmm. Yeah, very, very much so. And it's yeah. something that's 
severely missing from the uh, medical landscape of psychedelics is this aspect of community. There is always this model uh, in psychiatry and approach that you always treat individual, yeah. but no individual exists by themselves. You cannot treat, well, you can, and this, this is what it's done, is you treat somebody's depression, but it's not that you, you know, fix someone's brain or change neurochemicals or whatever. People exist in society, and there are so many aspects that contribute to mental health or uh, illness, and a lot of the aspects of this are social, a lot of them psychological. That's why you need the biopsychosocial model and very much relational with the community and with the wider world. So I think uh, the big problem with medical psychedelics is they always go for the individual rather than try to think of it as a more relational to the to the community and to the natural world even. Mm. So I'm thinking a little bit about Shakruna as well. But you haven't had much chance to talk about them and what they do and what your work involves with Shakruna, if you feel like sharing anything about that. Mm -hmm. With uh, Shakruna, I mostly work on a completely different topic, not, mm. not about phenomenology of uh, psychedelic experiences. So there is uh, another part of me, that uh, another aspect of life that I'm really interested in, and that's... Uh, biodiversity and conservation and ecology mm. and i did masters in conservation biology at imperial college and i studied ecology of peyote cactus um, in the united states and i'm still that was a few years ago but i'm still very much um, following this uh, research and generally i'm interested in the botany and um, conservation of natural occurring psychedelics so my mm. work with Chakruna is very much related to this. Mm. So I write articles about conservation aspects of natural occurring psychedelics, uh, about the, the Sonoran desert toads, of course, peyote cactus, uh, about controversies uh, around kapi, which is ayahuasca wine, mm -hmm. um, about iboga and other topics related to natural occurring psychedelics. So my main role in Chakruna, in terms of writing, is uh, writing about these topics. Uh, but I also edit articles and help to teach Chakruna courses. And yeah, I'm involved in editing other people's articles too. And Chakruna as a sort of um, organization focus on these topics of like con conservation uh, this is not the main focus of Chakruna at all. No, mm -hmm. Chakruna is very much focused on inclusion and diversity and uh, looking into less lesser talked about aspects of uh, psychedelic science and society. So they talk a lot about, for example, queering psychedelics is the conference that they have coming up in April. Uh, they talk about religion and psychedelics. They talk about um in inclusivity in psychedelic space so they diversity and uh, things like that but because yeah i'm not so much familiar with those topics i found my own niche so that's that's what i do there mm. i'm really interested in how that applies to five and your dmt then because it's is it is, am i right in thinking it's one of the few psychedelics that are you know maybe the only one are are toads vertebrates? I guess they are. It's a vertebrate. It's a psychedelic from within a vertebrate organism. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Are there any other ones? Uh, there are some fish that uh, supposedly contain uh, DMT. DMT fish. Or, yeah. <laughs> cool. So <Okay. laughs> there's, yeah. there was an episode of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia about this fish. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a type. Of, there are several species of fish. One of them is a sea bass that lives in Medi Mediterranean. Mm, that uh, that at certain times of the year allegedly has uh, psychedelic effects. Um, and I think there are some sea sponges that have uh, some variant of DMT in them as well. Interesting. Yeah. But uh, yeah, other than that, uh, Sonoran Desert Toad is uh, one uh, is the probably the only animal that contains psychedelics mm. 
I've read some rumors about some allegedly psychedelic containing ants, but yeah, I don't know. Nobody ever wrote anything <laughs> definitive on that. So yeah, Sonoran Desert Toad, which is a very, very large toad living in the Sonoran Desert in the United States and Mexico in its uh, gland secretions. Um, its gland secretions contain 15 to 30% 5-MeO DMT, mm. some bufotenin, some small amount of DMT and lots of other um, uh, substances, notably cardioglycosides, which are uh, poisonous. Mm. Uh, so yes, so toad venom is not something to be eaten orally when you vaporize it or smoke it those cardioglycosides get destroyed, so you just get the tryptamines from it. And it's, yeah, this is the natural form of where you can get 5-MeO-DMT. The problem is with, the, with it is with the popularity of 5-MeO-DMT and more and more people learning about it and wanting to do those toad ceremonies uh, is that more and more toads are milked uh, and milking is called the process of extracting the um, secretions from the glands. Colloquially, it's known as toad venom. It's not really venom because venom is yeah injected injected yeah. rather mm. than uh, something that's uh, that's uh, not so. If somebody bites you, it's venomous. If mm. you eat it, that's poisonous. Yeah, all right. So yeah, okay. technically, it's a, it's a toxin. It's a poison. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you can catch a toad and uh, press on the glands, you can extract the the toxin from the glands and then you dry it and then it can be smoked mm -hmm. uh, straight away and uh, if you catch the toad and milk them uh, and then release the toad in the same place and you use all the sanitary precautions that's in theory is fine but if you do it at scale to supply many, many retreats or retreats that uh, cater for hundreds of people as there are now in Mexico, for example, mm. um, when uh, with the increased popularity of 5-MeO DMT, uh, then the process of milking the toad is becoming less and less sustainable and toads are milked uh, repeated, repeatedly and that causes them a lot of stress and there is uh, a lot of um, potential for pathogens to spread uh, across different populations. And the way toads are milked is people drive along the roads with big trucks uh, and toads congregate next to the roads because they're attracted by lights, uh, because they eat insects that are attracted by lights. Mm. And so it's very easy to pick up lots of toads, load them in the truck, drive them somewhere, uh, milk them, and then just dump them somewhere else. So that's... Uh, takes toads out of their habitats, stresses them a lot. They cannot, they're dumped somewhere random where it might not be optimal mm. habitat. They cannot return back to, to it. And toads are also, they live for a very long time. They live several decades and they are very territorial. So relocating them is very, very bad. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, even if they're not relocated, for example, not washing hands between milking different toads can spread pathogens. And there is already now huge, huge pandemic that's been devastating amphibian populations in the last 20 years that already led to extinction of almost 100 species of amphibians. Right. And uh, yeah, not many people know about it. It's a uh, chytrid fungus. And it's now spread all over the world. Toads are less susceptible to it than frogs, but it still reduces their fitness and their survival, even if they do get it. And Sonoran Desert toads can get chytrid fungus. Mm. Okay, so it's a crucial time. Yeah, it's a crucial time. And there is very little research from uh, biological perspectives about the populations and the population densities, particularly in Mexico and US. It's a bit better studied and there are some volunteers that do toad counts, particularly in Arizona. Uh, but yeah, in Mexico, nobody knows how many of these toads mm. are there, how many are left, what are the effects of, say, climate change on toad populations, because yeah, toads need water, particularly the ones that live in the desert. And if there is climate change that results in 
less uh, water sources they have nowhere to to reproduce so it's mm. really 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 important to be very careful with those populations because they already they're also very sensitive to pesticides because they absorb everything through their skin mm -hmm. so really we shouldn't be doing extra add an extra pressure on already vulnerable potentially vulnerable populations so my harm reduction advice for the toads is to use synthetic 5-MeO DMT. Yeah. So how's that? Is that something that so that I imagine is what you're using in the in the trials, right? Yeah, that's that's what we use in the trial, of course, for uh different reasons, for the reasons like in clinical trials. Yeah. You always use synthetic to minimize variability and uh, to have the standard standard product that you administer to people as exactly the same person to person. Mm -hmm. But also even in uh, recreational or ceremonial use, people who use 5-MeO-DMT for the toad, certainly it's much better to use a synthetic one. And it's also better because you can, you know exactly the dose you're taking and um, uh, there are also, you know, that you're taking pure 5-MeO-DMT without all those other compounds that are found in toad secretions that we don't know yet the effect. So, mm. and of course, there are always going to be people who say, oh, natural is better or there is a spirit of the toad that's guiding my medicine journey. But yeah, rationally speaking, it's 5-MeO-DMT five, five that has psychoactive effects and pure 5-MeO-DMT can have as profound experiences subjectively as the toad. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. As you're speaking about the stuff that goes on in Mexico, it makes me think, is 5-MeO-DMT quite a new substance? I remember hearing something about that being, they're not being necessarily in the, you know, with psilocybin containing mushrooms, we have the evidence of and the the extant process in Mexican culture where it's been there for centuries and there's an understanding of the relationship with the fungus, its conservation amongst the people who use it, or at least they used to be. Um, am I right in thinking that the Sonoran Desert Toad isn't particularly part of an existing tradition? Uh, Sonoran Desert Toad, there is... Uh... Um, no conclusive evidence that it's been used uh, ceremonially by indigenous people. Mm. Uh, in the last uh, uh, decade or so, there are some indigenous groups that started to use the toad. Yeah. And uh, it's a very much a new tradition in the making. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, but yeah, there is uh, there is no evidence that there has been a long-standing tradition of the use of toad secre secretions. There are a lot of people who would have liked it otherwise, yes. and there are people who uh, try to look at the evidence and try to figure out whether toads were used ceremonially. And there are some interesting findings with the toads imagery or with like lots of toad bones found next to. Uh, various archaeological remains, but there is no conclusive evidence saying that those toads were there uh, for specifically because of their psychoactivity of their secretions. They might be uh, there because they uh, they play a role in mythology, uh, and very much the toads are symbols of fertility in many cultures, or it could be potentially other uses. We we don't know. Mm, but there's not, as far as we understand it, a living, like indigenous tradition. There is, a, there is a living indigenous tradition that started maybe ten years ago yeah. or so, but mm. it's more of trying to reclaim the identity and find healing yeah. in the face of uh, yeah, yeah. whatever colonial forces were. Similarly to the introduction of peyote, mm. I suppose. Yeah, similar to introduction of peyote to Native Americans yeah. uh, that happened maybe a hundred, hundred. Uh, 30 years ago yeah. and we see this now happening with uh, Sonoran Desert Toad but yeah, no, there is for Toad specifically, there is no historical unbroken tradition for using mm. them that's uh, anonymously agreed on uh, but what there is uh, 
long-standing several thousand years of traditions is the use of 5-amino DMT containing plants in South America. Right. Not in North America, but in South America. Okay. And uh, there is one of the oldest archaeological remains, uh, both of plant material and of various smoking and uh, snuffing peripheralia in the burials that are um, uh, from 3000 uh, BC. And what plants are there then that contain 5-MeO-DMT? Uh, these are uh, Anadenanthera plants. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is... Um, and the seeds, uh, the, these plants uh, have seed pods with seeds and the seeds have uh, a lot of bufotenin and some 5-MeO-DMT. Okay. And uh, the seeds are ground into snuffs or sometimes smoked. Mm. And uh, certain cultures, like there was a culture, I think, that lived uh, maybe one and a half thousand years ago that used it in psychoactive beer. Wow. Even. So this is older, as far as I know, in, than the evidence for carpi and ayahuasca. Yeah. Use. Yeah. 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 And uh, it's specifically used in snuffs and uh, smoked, this anodonanthera mm. uh, species. And there is also another, uh, another anodonanthera genus with two species that contain bufotenin and 5-MeO. And another genus uh, is virola. There are maybe 10 different 5-MeO containing uh, plants in this genus that's mm. used across different indigenous peoples in South America, more in the... Um, Amazon region, and they use it also as snuffs and uh, uh, enemas as well. Um, there are even some oral preparations in combination with other plants that I suppose make it orally active. So yeah, there are 5-MeO-DMT containing plants that have very long tradition and are still currently used. Mm, that's fascinating. And is that something that there is much study of and is there much dialogue between the kind of medical study of such substances and the the indigenous use of, of these uh, things? no i don't i don't think so i don't think there is much dialogue currently uh there are some interesting studies uh like uh, as always the great ethnobotanist richard evan schultes was mm. writing about it and mo but most of the research um, was done in the 60s to 80s on the cultures that, that are using those these plants. Okay, fascinating. So there's a big old, yeah, there's a big old gap, it sounds like. Yeah, it seems like there, there is a gap. And um, in terms of archaeological research, there is a wonderful book by Manuel Torres about Anadonanthera. And all the with beautiful photographs of all the snuff trays and pipes and all the findings that they f they found in uh, Argentina and Chile with uh, with this. There are also very interesting uh, combination in uh, very interesting iconography of Chavin culture uh, that uh, combined both San Pedro and the Anadonanser snuffs. Mm. I don't know if they used it at the same time or sequentially or for different purposes. I, I haven't, I'm not that familiar with that. But if you look at their archaeological, uh, at, at their uh, stellas and ruins, you can very often see San Pedro and Anadonanser depicted on the same image. That's fascinating. Very often, like mm. jaguar images as well, like mm. a jaguar holding San Pedro cactus with the, under the leaf of Adenanthera. Mm. That's really fascinating. So, yeah, it sounds like even ancient cultures understood that the different uses of these different uh, psychedelics with very different phenomenologies, very different pharmacologies, um, may have been appropriate for different circumstances. Yeah, for, yeah. for different circumstances and in different contexts and different methods of administration too. Mm. Yeah, really sophisticated and something that we're just coming back into contact with now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Where do you feel like the kind of research community is at the moment with this pluralism of psychedelics? Is there a tendency to be focusing on the broad class of psychedelics and the broad class of mental health difficulties and just being like, 
its first steps or is there an emerging understanding of differing psychedelics and their different uses in different contexts? Now we are in such early stages of, of this uh, second wave of psychedelic research that uh, it's still the field is uh, forming itself and taking different, different shapes and rapidly changing as well. Like I've been in psychedelic research since 2015, um, when I started working at the Beckley Foundation, the nonprofit one, and the, even psychedelic conferences back then looked completely different to what psychedelic conferences look now. Mm. Uh, currently, in particular, last two years with the arrival of all these pharmaceutical companies, mm. the landscape is very much shifting towards uh, medical. Uh, uh, clinical research and a lot of conferences really focus on the clinical clinical stuff, maybe brain imaging and uh, very much uh, like apl clinical applications of psychedelics. And uh, I kind of miss the times where psychedelic conferences had uh, looked at wider aspects of psychedelic culture where you can have a conference where one track would be this clinical neuroscience stuff, mm. then another track would be history, another track would be uh, more anthropology research, another track would be something very odd and weird of so people talking about their unusual experiences and whatever, and, and then another track would be artists or musicians. So I very much like that when psychedelics are so multifaceted, uh, topic and they can bring many interesting people and then those from different fields and those different people talk to each other and a lot of cross-pollination occurs and exchange of ideas while if uh, conferences and the space becomes more uniform and more um, and becomes just the uh, clinically focused then it's more it becomes more specialized in a sense uh, but yeah, maybe that's just my impression is that it's becoming, there is a lot more uh, leaning now towards just the clinical stuff and mm. removing all the weirdness out of psychedelics, mm. removing the more, the less, uh, uh, even removing more humanity based approach and trying to make it more exact science. Mm. So I think there is something to lose if we do that completely. But we are not quite there, and I think there is also a pushback against just medicalization of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the, I guess what you mentioned is one of your, you know, warmest uh, thoughts about psyche, the community around it, and one of the things that for me felt most uh, prominent to my psychedelic experiences, which is an experience of you know, connection with the other and connection with what's different and finding that kind of common ground that the conferences are almost more psychedelic when they can bring more disciplines together. Yeah. More honorable of that, the phenomenology of that experience and what it's doing for us, mm -hmm. I guess. And that sounds like a, an interesting place to, to pause maybe, but a, yeah, a whole, a psychedelic life, a psychedelic career. Thank you very much, Anya, for coming on and much appreciated. I hope that uh, this inspires people to yeah get in touch and uh, ask the big questions about psychedelics. That yeah, and thank you very know. much, Rodri, for bringing up some of those big questions. And of course, I, I don't know answers and a lot of answers uh, we need to figure out as a community together. And it's part of thinking that uh, we all have our own thoughts and then something comes together when we exchange those, those these thoughts. So in the spirit of Anya's closing remarks there, if you'd like to get involved in the conversation, if you'd like to give some feedback, or you've had your thoughts stimulated by what we've discussed on this podcast, or there's anything that feels relevant to you, or if you'd actually just like to suggest someone that you'd like to hear on the podcast, or introduce yourself, feel free to get in touch with me at rodri at psycareuk.org. That's R-H-O-D-R-I at psycareuk.org. Thanks once again, Anya, for your generosity in sharing all these different aspects of your psychedelic life and career with us. I think it's really inspiring for people to hear how 
these inklings can germinate and grow into fully-fledged psychedelic careers. Speaking of which, next time we will be speaking to a Lacanian psychoanalyst who has designs on the way psychedelics are being explored and marketed as medical products at the moment. Is there any scope for a society in which psychedelic use is normalized? And who gets to decide how we make sense of our experience? How can we ensure that we don't shut down the broad church of many different approaches that have sprung up in the decades since psychedelic prohibition? And in the meantime, if you're looking for psychedelic community, or if you're looking to unpack an experience that seems to hold a lot of meaning and mystery for you, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, horrific, terrific, or any other kind of ific, you can join the PsyCare monthly integration circle, which happens on the first Monday of every month online. And this is a peer-led space for processing, making sense of, and connecting over our mystical, psychedelic, and otherwise anomalous experiences, and helping us to bring the ecstatic state and the insights that it holds a little bit closer to our everyday life and mundane experience. So maybe I'll see you there. Otherwise, looking forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>